people of course have a comfort zone um, they like to to work within that comfort zone I think that as an independent author maybe it is my my duty to propose something different and then I think that a great part of the creative process is about finding out something that is different and that's uh, that's quite a challenge uh, because uh, well, you know that the market is pretty much flooded with lots of great things. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I am Gary Snow and joining me today is Gabriel Quiroga the creative mind behind Warpland and Hell Knight, which I named as my second favorite game in 2022. And Gabriel is now following up with the relaunch of Nero City, which here's the original version, uh, which is the first game that he had ever written. And uh, it's only got days left to back on Kickstarter. So we'll talk all about that in the upcoming episode. But uh, first of all, Gabriel, welcome. Hello, Gary. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Very stoked about uh, being here with you. Well, uh, you know, obviously, I am a big fan of your work. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, last time we talked, um, and I'll put a link to the uh, our very first uh, introduction episode so we can learn, if people want to learn about your history of how you got into game design in the first place, you can watch that. But when we were talking last, it was during the Hell Knight Kickstarter. And uh, just tell us, how did that go? Hey, the Hell Knight Kickstarter uh, did awesome. Uh, it seems that the the concept of the setting really catched on. I think there was a, like a space for RPG in RPG in the community for for that kind of game specifically. There, there was nothing that was like biker or heavy metal oriented in, set in specifically in the ninety in the eighties. So I think that the idea catched on. I had my my doubts at the beginning, but uh, I was surprised to find so so much interest about uh, Hell Knight, even for interviews for but, uh, articles from Fangoria and Dice Breaker. So there was a lot of interest about the game, and I think that the expectations were somehow fulfilled with the book. At least I'm very happy with how the book uh, ended up being. And we talked about your process uh, when you were in the Kickstarter that like, I mean, you kind of are one of those uh, designers that you're kind of working without a safety net. You're like on the tightrope without a safety net that you actually hadn't fully formed uh, Hell Knight completely and that you liked the pressure of like you're running the Kickstarter, but you're going to be designing it. And uh, I know that you were doing it through Exalted Funeral um, mm -hmm. uh, for the, the distribution for and the printing. Yes. And they were kind of like leery about that. But you came through with flying colors with your team uh, designing it. So uh, just tell us, like, was it nerve wracking to go through that design process? Stressful? Yeah. Um, yes, of course, it's uh, like uh, very exhilarating. Uh, I, I think that uh, creative processes uh, work very nicely. If you have like uh, a small amount of time, and you like keep... Uh, that driving force. So um, I usually uh, do all the concept um, for a few months. And once I nail the concept, the aesthetics, the music, and the whole atmosphere, and I have a big, big pile of notes, I propose the, the concept and the idea um, in the Kickst with a Kickstarter campaign. And I start writing and wrapping up the whole project. So uh, a lot of the... What I never know what it will end up being, but I am confident about the the, the idea and the concept, and I I I like the experience of uh, of not knowing how it will end up uh, being no the product. Uh, so I, I think that even for music that works as well. I remember uh, I read an interview a couple of uh, weeks ago with David Bowie talking about that and just uh, uh, going to a, to a cabin for two weeks to make a record. Uh, I think it's the same uh, to me that do, do things in a, like a thunderstorm, you know, uh, if you catch that vibe, it's like it, it shows up uh, with, uh, with the end product. And talk about your team. Cause I mean, I, I mean, I love the layout. And one of the things that I especially like about your, 
work and your philosophy of uh, game design and uh, is like there are no templates like each page is unique and I'll show some of these up on the screen but just in flipping through there's so many um, like and that's what I really appreciate is that this is like a unique piece of art um, as far as the game goes and just t talk about your team and the process of like the, the iterations with the graphic design and uh, mm -hmm. your writing. Yeah. How, how does that work for you? Uh, well, I think that uh, I, I somehow decided that the setting uh, will uh, nurture a lot from being uh, extremely chaotic and uh, that hold over the top violent vibe and I have decided to work with Tomas Spicoli uh, like two or three years ago. Uh, I have been talking with him. He's a very uh, important uh, do-it-yourself punk artist. He's also a musician. And I really appreci appreciate uh, his work. I am, a, I am a fan, actually, of him. I always go to his uh, shows to watch his band, Tilda Flippers. So once I decided I will jump on Hell Night, I went to one of his shows and I talked with him and I explained what uh, I was about to do. Uh, and he was uh, on board uh, uh, to do it. Uh, of course, he was, uh, he will do it his own way. So uh, working with him was uh, an experience of mutual respect. Uh, we really appreciate each other what we do. Um, it, it was a it was a very interesting experience to to do it, and uh, I understand that uh, the decision was to go uh, style over functionality or even readability. I think that what that causes is that uh it, it creates like um the book has like several layers you can you can just enjoy it uh, from the visual experience and you will get a lot about that because you will understand what the setting is about by just uh, sweeping it over but if you start to uh, delve in into it and to to make the effort to to be attentive uh, you will have like a second layer and you will find a lot of details because the, the writing really stands up and there is a lot. Uh, well, Tomas, every page is like a work of art for him. Uh, if you, for example, that, that page on the left, if you ask about him, it's like almost, almost five types of illustration. There is a lot of cut and paste work uh, on it, a, a very artisan work. Um, uh, to me, it's uh, amazing. It's, it's really what I was looking for uh, for this specific uh, setting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I just, and like I said, I, I appreciate the fact that it's not templated. And uh, when you see some of the other works and no slight about any other works, but sometimes you, you know, you get your spot illustrations and your templates. And I mean, ga all games are different and everything like this, but I really appreciate the work that goes into this because it's like uh, customizing each page and, a very immersive experience and like you said it's got that second layer of uh, like almost like easter eggs uh but you get a better sense of the world and it's very immersive so yeah I yeah thought... there are a lot of um uh, tongue in the cheek is, is the is expression or yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah a lot of that a lot of hu black humor dark humor uh, a lot of easter eggs as you say a, a lot of uh, like breaking the fourth wall and addressing directly the reader. Um, it's uh, to me it was very experimental as a, as uh, writing it. Uh, it was a lot of fun to write it. I really had fun. It's not a it's not a, such a serious setting as my other settings, so it was an opportunity to, uh, for me to to work uh, with another voice. I each setting for me has a a different voice and a different tone. Uh, I like to assume a character when I am writing it. So uh, to me, it's never like a, 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 I, I always assume a persona when I'm writing a, a setting. And you um, ran into probably what almost every other designer ran into during that period, which was logistics 
and there is like paper shortages and price increases and inflation. How did that flow for you? Because I know it was a difficult time for everybody. It was an extremely difficult time and I was surprised. Uh, you know that I'm uh, pretty much a newcomer to the industry. Uh, I am have two year old uh, experience. Uh, so at the beginning, I tried to I um, investigated about the possibility uh, of printing in Argentina that did not work well. Uh, Luckily, uh, prices uh, uh, went down a bit uh, after eight or nine months, so uh, I could print in America. So uh, the product uh, ended up uh, holding up, but it was very stressful for me. To me, uh, the printing process was uh, much more uh, stressful than writing the book. Yeah. Well, I can imagine like you have to, the margins on these types of games are so thin as it is. And then uh, you get curveballs thrown at you like that. And then uh, I think you ha also had a couple like trial trial runs and like trying to find the right printer to produce yes. the product that you wanted to find or to put out there. Yes. Yes. A lot of sampling and trial and error, but uh, we ended up finding a, a very good printer that managed to do the job uh, nicely. Uh, so I'm very happy about it. It was like uh, it was a long nightmare, but uh, it, to me, it's all about uh, doing the, the the work to be finished, you know. And uh, that's what what's most important for me. Uh, money is secondary. If I need to uh, maybe have some losses, it's not uh, it's not the main the main issue for me. To me, it's uh, satisfying expectation or, or maybe not expectations but being happy about uh, that the work is what i envision it to be and you also took the opportunity because you were doing the kickstarter that you were able to do the add-on mm -hmm, uh yeah. for warpland and produce which was previously done through drive through rpg but you were able to do warpland as a hardcover through the same printers i'm presuming yes yes same printer yes and so it's it's a it's a beauty, you know, a uh, nice hardback cover, and I think a lot of people appreciated that. Um, and both of those now, uh, how much stock is left at Exalted Funeral for people to buy? There's quite this about. Uh, I, I think that half of that stock is taken by by Exalted, and the other half, well, part of that half will be taken by already as an add-on for Neurosity. So there must be about 350 books left for Warblam and about 500 of Hell Knight. They should show up in Exalted Funeral beginning of next week or end of this week. Cool. Well, I mean, I just got mine like literally uh, a week and a half ago and I've been kind of pouring over it and I've been enjoying just kind of flipping through it and like absorbing everything. And both of them are beautiful products. And, uh, um, and as you mentioned... So now you're in uh, Kickstarter, and I keep saying NeuroCity. I heard NeuroCity. I've... So I'm going to go with NeuroCity on my end, but you correct me if I'm wrong. Going, going slowly back to, to Warlord, I think that uh, it the, that book really deserved it, uh, that uh, deluxe edition, mainly because it's all like a psychedelic setting. Um, uh, if the colors pop up, it really adds up to the setting. You know, the, well, the whole... A warp, um, well, it's a very colorful setting, warp lamp. So I think that uh, that edition was uh, really needed. Uh, I'm very happy about it also. And it's, uh, I'm very happy about how, how different the settings are from each other, you know? Yeah. It's a totally different thing. Um, I, I really love them. <laughs> is it hard have you found it hard um because they're so different but yet they're kind of the same the same vibe at least i would say do you find that your audience can the type of people that are your audience your fans do they like both sides of it as far as they your style is what they're after because it's like a different genre and a different feel to it but it's the same kind of vibe to it similar to style um Yes, yes, I think that um, some people are uh, Hell Knight fans or uh, others are, uh, for example, you know, I, I received an email from 
some Canadian friends uh, last week, and they have been playing Warband for two years now. Uh, every week, um, they really love that setting. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's a it's it, it proposes a different experience, so and a different mindset, uh, totally different mindset. We always with my play group, we always talk about that, about how the whole experience changes uh, when, when we switch settings. Uh, the music changes, the aesthetics changes, the the characters change, the problems and the theme changes. Uh, because well, we, when we make a setting, we always talk about themes and about uh, the conflict, what's, what's the main conflict and what will that propose to the player. Um, when you change that, uh, you change basically everything about the game. So I think that... Uh, of course, you you feel that uh, uh, you, you, the, the same author makes that book because, uh, of course, I have the same uh, preoccupations when I write. Uh, for example, technology is a, is a big problem for me, and you, you get that in Word, I and mean, you get that in Neurosity. Maybe you, you do not get it in Hell Knight, but... Uh, for sure, uh, different players are appealed to different settings. Yes. And we talked briefly before we started recording about uh, the just how people are so drawn to the fantasy genre. And when you have like different genres that you kind of have uh, or like make games for it, that it's sometimes I would, I kind of see it as a frustrating point that uh, people just tend to go back to fantasy genre and but you're putting out you know Hell Knight and, and Neurosity and uh, they're different. But do you do you find the same thing that like the uptake of it Warpland might be more popular? Um, yeah, I think that um, well, people of course have a comfort zone. Um, they like to to work within that comfort zone. I think that as an independent author, maybe it is my my duty to propose something different. Uh, uh, at least, I when I develop something, I always think uh, about developing something that is different. And I think that a great part of the creative process is about uh, finding out something that is different, and that's uh, that's quite a challenge uh, because uh, well, you know that the market is pretty much flooded with lots of great things uh, a lot of uh, great books going around and a lot of uh, very great talented people creating awesome stuff so I, I, honestly i don't think i would be able to to create something that um, is about classic fantasy uh, because there are so many great awesome things about classic fantasy and uh, I think that the new stuff about fantasy uh, are usually uh, different only because they are presenting maybe new systems or new mechanics. Uh, but the flavor to me, it's pretty much the same always. So uh, I really like to experiment between genres. Uh, Warblam, maybe it's uh, more closely to fantasy, but to me it's a very dark acid type of fantasy and it it even is also a science fantasy or a, a, what's also the name a, well about a, sun, a planet and sandals or something like that there were a lot of gen generals about that like a flash gordon and all that it, it also has a lot of that so um, I, I like to do a lot of cross gender and, and see what if it's possible to do for, for warbland the big the big deal was exactly doing that because, uh, to me, all if all science fantasy uh, settings uh, they always go the for the Gonzo uh, approach, you know. And the Gonzo approach is always like, okay, uh, suddenly a spaceship shows up, and it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't worry so much about creating a background for that. It's uh, almost absurd, and it's fun uh, uh, 
with that. Uh, it, it's it's comfortable about not explaining why everything is so absurd. And I wanted to try to propose a science fantasy setting that uh, really has a profound background and explains why everything is so fucked up. <laughs> and that, that is what that's what the challenge was about in Warplan. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think it's a great product, obviously. And uh, but we're here to talk about now you finalize this for me once and for all. Neurosity or Neurocity? I think last time I had you on, you said Neurocity, but I've heard Neurosity. Which what do you want people to call it? And I what always call it? Uh, I call it Neurosity, but uh it's it's um, it's not. I don't I don't feel it as my game. You know, everyone can call it whatever they like. It, <laughs> all my products is like uh, you make it your own game. Call it whatever you like. Make it your own. It's like a collaborative storytelling process. So yeah. uh, I really respect uh, everyone's vision and everyone's approach. So you, to games. You, you've put it out in the wild and it's for the people to do what they want with it now. Yes. Yes. That's the, I'm very conscious about uh, that part of uh, uh, my ideology about games. So I have, um, this was a drive through RPG print on demand, uh, neurosity, mm -hmm. uh, neurosity, yes. sorry, neurosity. And is this still available or is it off that, the market now? Uh, that is still available until the new edition comes out. Uh, I did not have an editor at those times, so this new version will really benefit from having Walton Wood, uh, who was a, a cyborg uh, editor and was the editor for Warblam and the ed my editor for Hell Knight. He's my my wingman. And so, so you can still get this, but we're going to talk about the new one. But you can still get this at Drive Through RPG. It's probably going to be a collector's item. So just FYI, you can get this one and then get the new one. Last so, chance, yes. Yeah, uh, and so you are now, like you said, you, you you when you first started, this was your first uh, game, and then you're now reflecting upon it. So here's the uh, new cover, um, and it's going to be a, a hard cover, just like uh, Warpland, same same sizing. So that square sizing. Yes, exactly the same size because. A neurosity and Warblam are very closely connected. I think about them as two sides of the same coin. Uh, the idea is that you can you can even have a character switch from one setting to the other. Uh, you never you it's not quite um, explain whether Warblam is a place inside neurosity or the other way around. There are many possibilities. Uh, each book. Uh, explains uh, or hints about that possibility, about that chance. Uh, so it's left for the the GM to to work that out or the players to work that out. But uh, yes, they they kind of work uh, between themselves those those products. So that's why they are exactly the same size and they are both hardbacks, and they will really like they will really enjoy being close to each other. <laughs> And for those that aren't familiar with it, what's the what's the kind of the the pitch of this dystopian future? What what do people deal with on a day day to day basis in this world? Uh, well, as you say, it's a dystopian city uh, run by a supercomputer. Um, players will be citizens uh, following orders by the supercomputer or the supervisors that work with the super, with the supercomputer. It's a tech noir, a dystopian tech noir. Uh, the inspirations are Alphaville from Godard and THX 1138 from uh, George Lucas. That was George Lucas' first film. I really like. I really like the vibe uh, about the setting. It's like a, it, it feels like a, a like a noir detective movie sometimes, but it's also very very dark and very horror. Uh, I like uh, the RPG cult really much, so it has a lot of cult. To me, it, it might feel like a mix between paranoia and cult. Uh, so yeah, well, you have that all the, that noir uh, detective uh, 
black and white uh, aesthetic. And it's a really awesome setting. Uh, I think that part of the appeal is uh, it's also about finding out what neurosity is about. Uh, player characters will start out as uh, being uh, part of the system, uh, fully functional citizens, and eventually uh, they will become like rebels or they will start finding that uh, things aren't what they seem. So understanding what the setting is about uh, is really part of the catch. And the book comes with several possibilities about what neurosity is really about, uh, what is the explanation uh, and the background behind behind the city. It can be anything. It can be it can be uh, maybe a uh, a dream. It can be an underground city. It can be in space. It can be uh, maybe a f underground fallout shelter. We don't know what neurosity is. And even if I go to a uh, uh, a session with, with an, a different play group, I will not know what uh, neurosity is about. So I think that that mystery is really, really cool. I really like it. And I, I, it allows for a lot of replayability. And how much of the original writing is still going to be intact? Like how much did you refresh that versus the layout and the graphic design? Uh, it's really hard to 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 give a percentage to that, uh, because um, I think that, uh, um, you, 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 for example, there are a lot of uh, new tables. There are a lot of uh, additional tweaks. Some things change. You get a new, you get a new class to choose for players. Uh, you have a lot of, for example, there is a chapter that is about channels and. Uh, TV and entertainment. Uh, there are a lot of tables that, for example, try to break the fourth wall uh, to create a vibe. So, for example, uh, you can roll on a table and it says uh, turn off most of the lights in the in the place uh, in the uh, in, in, in where in where you are playing and focus most of the lights on a single player. Uh, with the most tension, with the highest tension, and create that effect on that. So it works a lot with creating an emotion on the player and that emotion to reflect on the character. And it works a lot with that. Or for example, you can have a you can have a drone come and mind probe that player character, and the player has to read out loud all the notes written on his character sheet. And maybe he has something that uh, is a bit confidential uh, or might be dangerous to reveal, and that will cause an effect on on the on the on the narrative itself. So I think that it works a lot with very interesting things that really add another dimension to the game. Uh, so it's very difficult to to say how what, what percentage will change of that. I, I think it changes a lot. Uh, and maybe even adding uh, a small monologue about uh, an NPC saying something in the book uh, really adds another dimension about the setting itself and maybe another possibility that will end up causing a great effect, long-term effect on the, on the experience itself. So uh, I think uh, that it really amps up the, the setting a lot the changes we are doing and when you're looking at it now like and reflecting upon this being your first game and refreshing it um what did you learn about yourself as far as how you've grown as a game designer i think that the most valuable thing i i received uh, was a, a, a bit more of confidence about what i was doing and that created allowed me to experiment a lot, or experiment more with uh, with what I want to deliver. So that's a very valuable thing for for any artist to to be comfortable about doing about uh, what are the limits and how you can challenge those limits to see what's going to happen. And uh, again, it's all about uh, providing a different experience that somehow 
differentiates uh, from other games and other books. Uh, I think that, um, well, people uh, go to independent authors because of that, because they want, they, they are not so worried about uh, like doing a very established uh, product that it works always within a comfort zone or it's not uh, as mainstream. Cool. And so we, just to go through the Kickstarter, um, you know, different prices for different countries, et cetera, but uh, the deadline uh, to back is I put Sunday, May 21st. It's actually technically Monday, but it's like so early in the AM. Let's just call it Sunday, May 21st. Yes. Four so days left. You've just got days left to back this thing. So get on there and uh, I'll have links to the Kickstarter in the, the uh, just video descriptions. And so make sure you get out there. You can do a PDF or a PDF plus hardcover version of it. Uh, but as we've talked hopefully, about, like, uh, hopefully we will be able to reach the Smythe soon stretch goal, which will create a, a more a strong binding and really is really cool to have it. It's the same that Warp and Hellnet has. So I think that it will be something really appealing for for everyone. To me, especially. And, and <laughs> You have the option to do the um, add-ons from mm -hmm. uh, Hell Knight and Warpland. So you can still get those while they're still available through uh, is Exalted Funeral doing the distribution on this one as well? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, take, uh, take the chance now that we have uh, some stock left. So this is your kind of last warning. There's just days left. I would have gotten... Uh, uh, Gabriel on the show earlier. It's just been a busy time for me. I've uh, had to put the podcast on hold here for about a month and a bit because I've got uh, my nine to five job taking over. But now that I'm free, I wanted to make sure I got uh, Gabriel on the uh, well, on the show to talk about this. Oh, awesome, Gary. I really like uh, your podcast. You are one, one of my favorite interviewers. I really enjoy uh, being here and I really like watching uh, what you do. I think it's a really valuable asset for the community well i appreciate those kind words and uh, i'll throw it right back at you as far as like you're one of my favorite designers in the space right now and uh, i always look forward to um like seeing where your mind of creativity is going and speaking of which where is it going hey well after this we have a, a few projects uh, for the, uh, what's left of the year uh, i will be probably launching a card game that will be set in Hell Knight. Uh, it's going to be called Sigil. It's a very cool uh, card game um, with a very nice punk aesthetic. And I'm also looking forward to launch a new setting called Meltdown. Uh, it's going to be uh, like a post-apocalyptic Mad Max setting with some superheroes and science fiction vibe. Uh, we are already play testing that, and we're having lots of fun. Uh, I am working on the on the on the aesthetics for that, on on the art already about that. So I think it's going to be something really, really awesome and amazing. Cool. Well, you know, once again, uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, for those watching. Get out there and back uh, indie game designers like Gabriel. Uh, Kickstarter, there's just days left. Look at the link descriptions uh, uh, to get uh, the link to Kickstarter and support all these creativity, uh, creative uh, minds that are producing cool games like Gabriel is. So, uh, uh, Gabriel, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, hope to have you back for your next uh, product. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Support the indie scene. Gracias, right muchas gracias. Mm-hmm. <laughs>